George Soros is an American financier, investor, and philanthropist, a supporter of the theory of an open society, and an opponent of market fundamentalism. His activities are controversial in different countries and different circles of society. Voluntarily parting with part of his wealth, George Soros managed to leave a mark in many areas outside the world of finance and to some extent even influenced the course of history. Investor and speculator George Soros also managed to become famous as a philanthropist and as a philosopher and as a politician with very liberal views. George Soros was born in Budapest on August 12, 1930, to a middle-class Jewish family. George's father, Tividar Shorosh, was a lawyer and publisher. He tried to publish a magazine in Esperanto. In 1914, Tividar volunteered for the front, was captured by the Russians, and was exiled to Siberia, where he spent three years from the first days of the revolution in 1917 until the end of the Civil War in 1920, from where he fled back to his native Budapest. If George's father taught him the art of survival, then his mother, Elizabeth, instilled in her son a love for art as such. George liked drawing and painting more, and to a lesser extent music. Although the family spoke Hungarian, he also learned German, English, and French. The boy excelled in sports especially swimming, sailing, and tennis. He was fond of all kinds of games. He especially enjoyed playing Capital, the Hungarian version of the American game of Monopoly. From the age of seven, he often played this game with other children and almost always won. Worst of all was George Litvin. Mutual friends were not surprised to learn that George Soros had become a virtuoso financier and Litvin, a historian. At school, George studied either well or badly. Classmate Miklos Horn. George was a cheeky, even offhand guy, and I was quiet and calm. He loved fights. He even became a good boxer. According to Miklos Horn, George was far from being a brilliant student, rather average. But his tongue was great. And classmate Ferenc Nagel recalls, George was often cheeky with his elders. If he believed in something, he defended his faith unwaveringly. He was tough and domineering. When World War II began in September 1939, George was nine years old. The threat of a German invasion of Hungary began to emerge. By the spring of 1944, the Nazis had killed most of the Jews in Europe. There were growing fears that the term would reach the largest community of millions of Hungarian Jews in Eastern Europe. Hiding has become a way of life. The basement, surrounded by solid stone walls, served as a refuge. Often they lived for weeks in the attics and basements of their friends' houses, not even knowing if they would have to leave in the morning. Soros admitted to his biographer that the best year of his life was 1944 when he and his family were in mortal danger. In that year, George Soros saw his father's deadly forgery save the lives of his family and many others, while hundreds of thousands of Jews were exterminated by the Nazi regime. I was lucky that my father was one of those who did not act as people usually do, says George Soros. If you act normally, you will most likely die. Many Jews then did not take any action to hide or leave the string and my family is lucky. My father was not afraid to take risks. The life lesson that I learned during the war is that sometimes you can lose everything, even your own life, if you don't take risks. In the autumn of 1945, he returned to school, but he believed that he should immediately leave Hungary for the West. Exactly two years later, in the fall of 1947, at the age of 17, he left the country alone. George first stayed in Bern, Switzerland, but soon moved to London. Thanks to the help of his father, there was enough money for the journey. But now he had to rely only on himself and even on transfers from his aunt, who managed to move to Florida. In England, George Soros took a job as a waiter at the Quilino restaurant in Myfair, where London aristocrats and movie stars dined lavishly and danced the night away. 
Sometimes, being completely broke, the future billionaire ate the rest of the cakes for the visitors. Many years later, he enviously remembered the owner's cat, which, unlike him, ate sardines. George's occupations changed frequently, but remained casual. In the summer of 1948, he took a job on a farm as part of the Put Your Hands on the Earth program. Soros was picking apples in Suffolk. He also worked as a painter, and then more than once boasted to his friends what a good painter he was. Odd jobs, poverty, and loneliness gave little reason for fun, and for all subsequent years Soros could not get rid of depressing memories. Like Freud and Einstein in 1949, George Soros entered the London School of Economics. He attended some lectures by Harold Lasky and studied for a year with John Mead, who won the 1977 Nobel Prize in Economics. Although Soros graduated in two years, he hung around the school for another year before graduating in the spring of 1953. After reviewing the book The Open Society and Its Enemies, he tracked down its author, the philosopher Karl Popper, wanting to learn more. Popper was a famous philosopher who wanted to pass on his wisdom to the aspiring intellectual but he was by no means willing to help Soros succeed in life. According to Popper and many others, philosophy is not meant to indicate how to make money. But to George Soros, philosophy seemed suitable for this very purpose. Later, he would move from theory to practice. He would develop a theory about how and why people think the way they did and not otherwise. And on the basis of this, he would derive new theories about the functioning of the money market. At 22, a degree in economics did little for Soros. He took on any job, starting with selling bags in Blackpool, a seaside resort in the north of England. But trade was given with great difficulty. Even during graduation, Soros' intuition told him that big money could be made in the investment business. Trying to get a job in one of the investment banks in London, George randomly sent letters to all the banks in the capital. When Singer and Friedlander offered an internship, Soros happily accepted. With the ardor of a beginner, he began trading gold mining stocks, trying to capitalize on the difference in their market value in different markets. Although George did not do very well, he felt at home in this world and discovered a taste for working in the money markets. In 1956, a young investment banker decided it was time to get ready to go to New York. Shortly after arriving in the U.S., one of his London colleagues helped George get a job. A call to one of the partners of the investment firm FM Mayer and Soros began to engage in currency arbitrage. He was a pioneer. What George did 35 years ago has only come into vogue here in the last decade, noted Stanley Druckenmiller. Soros' right-hand man since 1988. In the early 1960s, no one knew anything, Soros recalled with a smile. Therefore, I could attribute any indicators to the European companies that I pushed here. This is exactly the case when the blind leave the blind. In 1963, Soros began working for Arnold and S. Blackroder, one of America's leading overseas investment companies. His wide connections in Europe and the ability to communicate fluently in five languages, including German and French, were very useful to him for successful work in this area. Previous theorists of the stock market decided that the price of stocks is determined mainly in a rational way. Rationalists argued that if investors have all the information about a company, then each share of the latter can be valued in accordance with its true price. But George Soros looked at things deeper. He believed that if economics is a science, then it must be objective. That is, economic actions can be passively observed without affecting these actions themselves. But this, according to Soros, is impossible in practice. How can economics claim to be objective if people, namely, they are the final subjects of economic action, are not objective? If these people, by virtue of their participation in economic life, cannot but influence this life itself? Those who recognize the rationality 
and logic of economic life also argue that the financial markets are always right, at least in the sense that market prices tend to take into account future events, even when their possible course is not entirely clear. According to Soros, this is simply impossible. Any opinion about future events is biased. I do not mean to say that facts and opinions exist independently of each other. Quite the contrary, and I argued this in a more detailed exposition of the theory of reflexivity, opinions change facts. Prior to Kennedy's introduction of a surcharge on foreign investment, this type of activity brought in a good income. After that, Soros' business was destroyed overnight, and he returned to philosophy. From 1963 to 1966, he was trying to rewrite the dissertation, which he began working on after business school and returned to writing his treatise, The Heavy Burden of Consciousness. But the demanding George Soros was not satisfied with his brainchild, as he believed that he was simply conveying the thoughts of his great teachers. In the end, while working at Arnold and Blackroder, where he rose to the rank of vice president, George Soros decided that he was much more talented as an investor than as a philosopher or top manager. In 1967, he managed to convince the management of Arnold and Blackroder to establish several offshore funds and entrust him with the management of them. The first foundation, called First Eagle, was founded in 1967. The second, already so-called, hedge fund, double ING, appeared in 1969. George started out with $250,000 of his own. Soon, another $6 million came from several wealthy European acquaintances. Soros soon managed to attract an international clientele of wealthy Arabs, Europeans, and Latin Americans. Although Soros ran the fund from headquarters in New York, like many offshore funds, Double Eagle was registered on the island of Curaçao. Antilles, the Netherlands, where it turned out to be out of reach for taxes. If the early 1970s ended badly for many on Wall Street, George Soros was a welcome exception. From January 1969 to December 1974, the fund shares nearly tripled in value, from $6.1 million to $18 million. In 1976, the Soros Fund grew by 61.9%. Then in 1977, when the Dow fell 13%, the Soros Fund rose another 31.2%. Soros bought up Japanese, Canadian, Dutch, and French stocks. For a time in 1971, a quarter of his fund's assets were invested in Japanese stocks. One of his former employees said this, Like any good investor, he tries to buy pennies for a penny. In 1979, Soros renamed his Double Eagle Foundation. Now it was called Quantum, in honor of Heisenberg's discovery of the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. Soros really excelled in the foreign exchange market. He sold the British pounds on the eve of their depreciation. He actively traded in English government bonds, the so-called Gold Edge Papers, which were in great demand, since they could be bought in parts. Soros bought these bonds, according to rumors, for a billion dollars, earning about 100 million at once. By 1980, 10 years after the creation of the Doble Eagle Hedge Fund, Quantum, Soros had achieved an unprecedented increase in the value of assets by 102.6%. By that time, their price had risen to $381 million. By the end of 1980, Soros's personal fortune was estimated at $100 million. Ironically, the main beneficiaries of Soros's talent, besides the investor himself, were a few wealthy Europeans, the same people who contributed the much-needed seed money to the Soros Fund in 1969. We didn't need to make these people rich anymore said Jimmy Rogers, friend and colleague of Soros. But we made them downright sickeningly rich. In June 1981, Soros appeared before the public on the cover of the Institutional Investor magazine. Next to his smiling face was the phrase, 
the world's greatest investment manager. The subtitle read, George Soros has never suffered a loss, and his successes command respect. We will talk about how he caught on to new trends in the investment business in the 70s and ended up amassing a personal fortune of $100 million. The article explained how Soros earned his fortune. With only $15 million in assets in 1974, the Soros Fund had grown to $381 million by the end of 1980. In 12 years managing the money of clients like Gelring and Pearson in Amsterdam or the Rothschild Bank in Paris, Soros has never ended a financial year with a loss. In 1980, the fund showed an impressive growth rate of 102% per year. Soros turned capital duties into his personal fortune, estimated at about $100 million. Ironically, immediately after the publication of the article, 1981 turned out to be the worst year for the foundation. Quantum shares fell 22.9%. For the first, and so far the last, time, the fund ended the year with no profit. The departure of a good third of investors cut the fund's funds by half to $193.3 million. Soros began to think about closing the fund before he retired, Soros knew he had to get the fund into safe hands. He spent most of 1982 looking for that right person. Finally, he discovered it in the distant state of Minnesota. Jim Marquez was then a 33-year-old child prodigy running a large mutual fund, the IDS Progressive Fund, in Minneapolis. By the end of 1982, Quantum had grown by 56.9%, increasing its asset value from $193.3 million to $302.8 million. Jim Marquez began work on January 1, 1983. Soros managed half of the fund's total assets. He divided the other half among 10 other managers. In late 1983, Soros and Marquez were reaping the benefits of success. The fund's assets increased by 24.9% or $75.4 million, reaching $385.5 million. Although Soros moved into the shadows, his contribution to the work remained considerable. He still spent a lot of time abroad, a month and a half in late spring in London, a month in China, Japan, and a month in Europe in the fall. He spent his summers in Southampton on Long Island in New York. 1985 was a very successful year for Soros. Compared to 1984, Quantum showed a staggering 122.2% growth rate. The value of his assets rose from $448.9 million at the end of 1984 to $1,003 million at the end of 1985. One dollar invested in his fund in 1969 was worth $164 at the end of 1985, after fees and charges. Profit, quantum, for 1985 amounted to $548 million. Based on Soros's 12% stake in the fund, his share of the fund's profits for 1985 was $66 million in addition to $17.5 million in fees and a $10 million bonus from clients. In total, George Soros earned $93.5 million this year. By early January 1986, Soros had shaken up his entire investment portfolio. Playing for the increase in the price of shares of American companies, he actively traded stocks and futures in other countries, and brought the total volume of transactions to $2 billion. 40% of the shares and two-thirds of the foreign shares were associated with the Finnish Stock Exchange, Japanese Railways and Japanese Real Estate, as well as real estate in Hong Kong. On September 22, 1985, George Soros bought up millions of Japanese yen. The next day it became known about the fall of the dollar against the yen from 239 to 222.5 yen, or 4.3 percent. Soros, much to his delight, made $40 million overnight. 
he later called it. Sheer nonsense. Of all the financial transactions that Soros conducted, his currency speculation is the most famous. On Black Wednesday, September 16, 1992, Soros opened a short position for the pound sterling in the amount of more than $10 billion, earning more than $1.1 billion in one day. Withdraw the pound sterling from the mechanism for regulating the exchange rates of European countries, which led to an instant fall of the pound against major currencies. It was from that moment that Soros began to be mentioned in the press as the man who brought down the Bank of England. At the end of June 1993, it became known that George Soros, according to the calculations of the Financial World magazine, earned the most in 1993 on Wall Street. The magazine jokingly tried to make Soros' 1993 salary more tangible. If Soros were a public company, he would be ranked 37th in terms of profit in the U.S. between Bank One and McDonald's. His salary exceeds the GDP, gross domestic product, of at least 42 UN member states and is roughly equal to the GDP of countries such as Guadeloupe, Burundi, or Chad. In other words, he can buy 5,790 Rolls Royces for $190,000 each, or pay for the education of all the students of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Columbia University combined for three years. The magazine also noted that in 1993, Soros single-handedly earned as much as the McDonald's Corporation with 169,000 employees. All of his investment funds were doing well. Quantum imaging growth increased its net worth by 109% and quantum and quota by 72% each. George Soros's way of doing things stems from a combination of his personal qualities that can be simply unrepeatable. Firstly, his huge natural mind, like Andrew Carnegie, Aristotle Onassis. Soros has the best understanding of cause and effect in the entire global economy. If A happened, then B must happen, and after it C, in this case, various countries of the world are analyzed. Secondly, he is very determined. He himself can deny his own courage when he claims that the meaning of the secrets of survival is the key to successful investments. And knowing these secrets sometimes means lowering the stakes in a game, preventing losses when they are unacceptable, and always having sufficient reserves. I emphasize, an instant reduction in rates, the decision is made in a split second. Thirdly, the actions of Soros simply require strong nerves. I was in his office when he made decisions on hundreds of millions of dollars of deals," said Daniel Doran, a legal expert and director of the Jerusalem Center for Economic Progress. I wouldn't sleep at night for fear. And he plays with such sums. This requires nerves of steel. Maybe he just tempered them so much. Fourth Dispassion Alan Raphael, who worked with Soros in the 1980s, believes George's rare stoicism among investors has served George well. Such people can be counted on the fingers. When George makes a mistake, he doesn't fumes. But he does not say that he is right, and not others. He immediately admits his mistake and leaves the game, because the continuation of incorrect bets threatens ruin. You need to remember this all the time, even at home or in a dream. It completely consumes you. The eyes pop out. If this business were easier, then even laboratory assistants would be engaged in it. But it requires extraordinary self-discipline, self-confidence, and, most importantly, dispassion. Fifthly, George Soros has an extraordinary intuition, again, like Andrew Carnegie, Aristotle Onassis. Insights are inscrutable when it is worth speculating big, and when to quit the game, realizations when you understand the situation correctly, and when you are wrong, etc., etc., summing up. The talents of George Soros, an investor, Byron Veen states, George's genius lies in his extraordinary self-discipline. He looks at the market from a purely practical point of view and knows what forces affect stock prices. George understands 
that the market contains both rational and emotional aspects. And he knows that he also sometimes makes mistakes. J. Soros. As a rule, I just put forward a certain hypothesis and test it in the market. If I am wrong and the market reacts differently, then I am very worried. Sciatica starts, but when I correct the mistake, the pain disappears. I feel at ease. That's how intuition works. Soros' intuition is manifested in the ability to anticipate changes in the stock market in one direction or another. You can't learn this in school, not even at the London School of Economics or Harvard Business School. Very few people have such a gift. Soros is one of them. Perhaps the most striking feature of Soros' character, which best explains his talents as an investor, was the ability to enter a kind of closed club that includes the entire top of the international financial community. This club does not apply. Most of its members are political and economic leaders of the richest countries, prime ministers, finance ministers, directors of central banks. According to rough estimates, their total number does not exceed 2,000 people scattered throughout the world. Few, very few investors are admitted into this club like Soros. While others read about the leaders in the newspapers, Soros speaks directly to them. Breakfast with the finance minister, lunch with the central bank director, or a social visit to the prime minister. Since 1997, Soros has had a black streak. Almost all investments brought huge losses. And all his failures began with the acquisition of a controlling stake in the Russian company Sviazinvest. In 1998, he himself called this investment the main mistake of his life. At that time, Soros and Potanin created the Mustham Offshore, paying $1.875 billion for a 25% stake in Sviaz Invest. But at the end of the 1998 crisis, the price of the shares was already several times lower. Soros in 2004 sells shares of the firm for $625 million to Axis Industries and the buyer soon resells them for $1.3 billion to Comstar OTS, which is part of AFK Sistema. Thus, Soros could earn a huge amount with the right tactics. As early as the summer of 1999, business circles in Europe and America were talking about Soros losing his financial sense. Then it became known that the Quantum Fund lost almost a billion dollars in just a few months. About $700 million went down the drain in an attempt to short the shares of internet companies. In early 1999, Soros sold off these shares, predicting that the bubble is about to burst. Since April 1999, the value of these shares on the stock market, on the contrary, has grown at a frantic pace. Another $300 million Soros slipped, betting on the growth of the newborn euro. Other Soros funds lost another $500 million on the same miscalculations in the first half of 1999. Thus, in just six months, Soros shamefully blew one and a half billion. He had never lost that kind of money before. Over the previous 30 years of Quantum's existence, its revenues grew by an average of 30% annually. Shareholders rushed to withdraw capital from Soros funds. Investors were not stopped by the fact that not everywhere in the financial empire of Soros, things turned out to be so bad. For example, the European quota, which manages $2 million worth of assets, managed to increase their value by 20%. Soros withstood this blow. He managed not only to stop the outflow of capital from his funds, but also to attract new investments. But at the end of 1999, he made a mistake again. He invested heavily in internet stocks, this time without calling them a bubble. At first, it even seemed that Quantum had taken revenge. In early 2000, the value of assets under its management rose to $10,500,000,000. But the market played a cruel joke with Soros for the second time. If a year ago, according to one of the top managers of Quantum, the management of the fund, felt too early that the internet bubble was about to burst. 
Now they simply missed the collapse of the Nasdaq index. In just two weeks in April, Quantum lost $3 billion. Stanley Druckenmiller, who has managed the fund since 1989, said, I'm smashed. I should have withdrawn assets from the market in February, but for me, this business was like a drug. And at the end of April, he resigned. In total, in the first quarter of 2000, Soros lost, according to some estimates, $5 billion, that is, more than three times more than in the tragic 1999. He lost, including the continuation of the depreciation of the euro. The financier stepped on the same break twice, continuing to hope for the potential of the new currency. Now the aged billionaire has decided he's had enough. So you can lose your legal pension. The time for big deals is over for us, Soros announced as he closed the largest of his funds. He still has something, though. George Soros is known not only as a financier, but also as a philanthropist. American law allows its citizens to spend no more than 50% of their income on charitable purposes. George Soros was and remains the only U.S. citizen who completely and regularly exhausts this limit. That's about $300 million a year. Wealth has given me the opportunity to do what I think is important, to realize my dreams of a better world order. Sooner or later, the peoples and their elected governments must take responsibility for creating an open society, not only in Russia, but throughout the world. When that time comes, my motives will become clear, and no one will ask why I helped. George Soros in 1979, George Soros created his first charitable foundation, the Open Society Fund, in the United States. Soros currently spends an average of $300 million annually on his nonprofit projects. Now, he has established charitable foundations in more than 30 countries. In 1988, in the USSR, Soros organized the Cultural Initiative, Fund in Support of Science, Culture and Education, but the fund was later closed, as the money was used for personal purposes by certain individuals. In 1995, it was decided to organize a new Open Society Foundation in Russia. For the second time, Soros was surprised to find that dollars allocated for scientific programs are deposited in suspicious banks, and easily grasping the meaning of the concept of turning money, Soros came to the conclusion that the ratio of corruption and efficiency in this case leaves much to be desired. After that, the composition of the Moscow board immediately changed. From 1996 to 2001, the Soros Foundation invested about $100 million in the University Internet Center's project, as a result of which 33 Internet Centers appeared in Russia. In late 2003, Soros officially withdrew his financial support for his philanthropic work in Russia. Already in 2004, the Open Society Institute stopped issuing grants. But the structures created with the assistance of the Soros Foundation are still actively working without his direct participation. Such projects include the Moscow Higher School of Social and Economic Sciences, the Pro-ARD Institute Foundation for Culture and Art, the D.S. Likachev International Charitable Foundation, the Pushkin Library, a non-profit foundation for supporting book publishing, education, and new information technologies. With such a scope, of course, the question of intentions arises. Some argue that making donations is more pleasant than paying taxes. Others think that Soros is doing charity work out of love for democracy, which he calls an open society. Still others suspect that Soros is tormented by complexes and guilt for his speculative stocks. Some claim that Soros has delusions of grandeur and a thirst for world domination, he is preparing to capture future markets. Others believe that Soros is buying public opinion in this way, accusing him of the collapse of national currencies. Others stubbornly argue that Soros is a spy and his philanthropy is a cover for intelligence gathering or political subversion. And all this seems to be true. Croatian President Tudjman accused Soros of supporting traitors and called the concept of an open society a dangerous new ideology. 
Romanian President Iliescu argued that Soros was maliciously supporting the opposition, although the fund only helped independent newspapers there. In addition to charity, George Soros provides financial support for initiatives to legalize marijuana and allow same-sex barks. In his article, Why I Support Marijuana, published in the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday, calls on the U.S. government to legalize marijuana. Our marijuana laws do more harm than good, Soros writes. Marijuana has been and remains the most popular illegal drug in the U.S. and elsewhere, and bans on its distribution only lead to higher prices and more negative attitudes towards these laws. Soros wrote many books during his life, including The Alchemy of Finance and Supporting Democracy. Now George Soros lives in the penthouse of one of the skyscrapers in the center of New York. He arrived in Manhattan some 50 years ago with big ambitions and only a couple of dollars in his pocket. Today, he is richer and more powerful than many of the nations whose flags fly at UN headquarters near his current home. However, despite this, the walking embodiment of the American dream, the first person in the world who managed to earn $20 billion in one year and became famous for the collapse of the Bank of England, remains a mystery to the whole world in many ways. His philosophical revelations and thoughts about finance and economics in numerous books and publications in fact once again convinced George Soros of the ambiguity of the figure. Journalists and biographers have not come to a consensus on what is the secret of his success and what motives underlie his actions. What do you think of George Soros? Write your opinion in the comments.